That's fine. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Saroosh Talili, and I'm working for NCC Group as a security consultant. Welcome to uh, WAF Bypass Techniques. So today, I'm going to talk about a number of methods to bypass web application firewalls. These methods are not new, probably. Uh, most of them have been discussed in the past, but they have been overlooked, so I'm going to discuss them today. My slides contain a lot of HTTP requests, so if you are a HTTP lover, you're in it for a treat. So if you are a pen, pen tester and you have a web application firewall in front of your web application, uh, when you're doing uh, web application testing, uh, you're gonna be mad. It's, it's a nightmare because uh, the testing is very slow and it, uh, so, and it doesn't provide a satisfactory result because some of the uh, automated testing requests are going to be killed silently. So you're not sure if, uh, for example, all of your scans have been successful as, and as a human being, you can make mistakes, you can't cover everything manually. But you may ask, you're the hacker. You have been trained for this. Why can't you just bypass the WAF? It's part of the assessment. The answer is time. So we don't have enough time during a web application assessment to basically assess the WAF as well. We can only test the web application assessment during one week or two weeks that we have for the web app. And then if there is a WAF there, then what would happen is it's gonna block us and it's gonna slow down the test. So you don't get value for your, for your money. And also, it does reduce the quality of the report because uh, it means that you're not going to have all the issues in your report. At the same time, WAF effectiveness test is completely a separate assessment. So you basically, if, if you, you have to go for that assessment if you want to assess your WAF, or you have to go for a normal web application assessment. So where can you find some WAF to bypass maybe? First of all, if you have permissions, then you can do this. You can just send a basic cross-site scripting or SQL injection to a website and to see if you, you can receive one of these error messages, access denied or something. And it doesn't <coughs> matter if the parameter is valid or not. You can just send it over and see what would happen. If you get one of these access denied, probably there is a WAF and you have to bypass it if you are doing a test on it. So, WAFs are based on uh, whitelist or blacklist. Whitelists are more secure. You basically, uh, you, it, it does only allow good things to go through. And blacklists are less secure, and they have a database of things that are bad and shouldn't go through. That said, whitelist WAFs are very hard to basically be trained, to be configured. You need a specialist for, that, for them. And then uh, you basically, they are very high, man, high maintenance. So if you change your web application, what would happen is that you have to train your WAF again. And you have to tell the WAF that this is a new page, these are the new parameters. You have to allow these to go in. So all that is just hard work and it is very, very expensive. Blacklists, on the other hand, are cheap. You can just basically uh, pay a small minimum amount of money for uh, a WAF in the cloud, put it in front of your web server, and that's it. Um, and normally, you don't need to change any configuration on them. Saying that, sometimes you still need to do a little bit of configuration changes, but as soon as you do that, it's fine. It, everything is fine with the blacklist ones. So the blacklist ones are the most popular ones, and the ones that I'm going to discuss here today. Before I, I start with the methods and everything, let's just talk about something that is out there and most people know about it. You may know that it's very easy to put a WAF in the cloud in front of your uh, website. By changing the DNS server to the WAF company's DNS, all the requests are now going through the WAF and you're secure. However, if someone knows your IP address, they, can they probably can still send the request directly to you without going through the WAF. Thinking that the IP address is basically a secret and you can keep it secret forever is completely wrong. There are a lot of methods to find the IP address and sooner or later, someone will find the IP address and your WAF will be bypassed. So if you're going to do that, my recommendation is to set a very, like a secret header or something in the, the, in the WAF panel and uh, on the web application side, you basically have to say, if you can't see this header, it's not coming from the WAF, so just kill it. 
Yes, that can make a bottleneck. Uh, and if there is a denial of service on the WAF, you may go down. But at the same time, it will, uh, it will make sure that you always have a WAF in front of your web applications. And these WAFs in the cloud are very useful. They give you a lot of statistics. You, you don't need to maintain them. They are very cheap. That's why many people are using them these days. So I have categorized the WAF bypasses into a number of categories. So the, the first category that uh, you, everyone knows about are the new or missed payloads. So if a payload is not in that uh, blacklist database and you use that, obviously it can go through because it's not there. Also, if you start changing the payload, for example, uh, change the uh, capitalization, make it uppercase, or apply encoding, and do these kind of things on the payloads, then it may go through as well. At the same time, some of the WAFs have some ex uh, exceptions set. So developers think, okay, uh, I, we, have, we have this like certain user agent old Nokia phone, that whenever they're browsing our website, we're blocking them because they're sending something unusual. So let's just say whenever this is the user agent, uh, you don't need to go through all these rules and all these WAFs. So if you find those kind of like exceptions, you can bypass the WAF easily. But it's, it's kind of sometimes it's very difficult to find those because they are secrets. But also, there has been something in the past that if you were sending a large request to a WAF, you could have bypassed it as well, because WAFs were like, this is very large for me to handle. It may cause denial of service. It looks like a file upload. I can't do anything about it. And without inspection, it can go through. So that's another method. However, today, I'm going to talk about payload delivery and request mutation techniques. So let's start with payload delivery. There are a number of methods that you can send your HTTP request to a server. So depends on the, these methods. If WAFs don't know about them, uh, they can be bypassed. So for example, um, a few days ago, I saw this uh, very good uh, vulnerability blog post about unsupported SSL TLS ciphers by the WAF. So basically, the guy who found this identified this issue that there was a WAF, and when the WAF couldn't understand the SSL cipher, uh, and, but that cipher was being supported by the web server, was basically passing everything through to the web server and was bypassing the WAF. And it was very good research, and I, re I was really amazed by that. And I was thinking, maybe, perhaps you can just apply to HTTP2 as well. I don't know. It might be possible. But then now, if you set that cipher in Burp Suite uh, and put it in front of, like, uh, put it, set it on the browser, then maybe you can just bypass the WAF and just test as usual. Today, however, I'm just going to talk about HTTP version 0.9 and HTTP pipelining, because those are uh, interesting, and also normally developers, even testers, don't know about them that much, and they have been forgotten. So I'm going to talk about those things. So let's start with HTTP version 0 0.9. This is, the, this is the, basically the first HTTP that came out. It didn't have any version. It was just one line of a GET request, GET a slash, that's it or get a slash page, that's it. That was the request. Uh, no header was sub being supported, no HTTP version, nothing. It was just a request to uh, an IP address, and that was it. So, and so it's very old. And because it's very old, and most of the WAFs are not new, they may not know about these, uh, these kind of like requests. So, but what can go wrong with HTTP version 2? It doesn't support header, it doesn't support a lot of things. And, and the latest version of RFC uh, for HTTP 1.1 says that it should not be supported at all. But during my research, I realized that all the web servers that I was testing were supporting HTTP version 0.9 and still like today. So it's being supported. At the same time, you can still send an absolute URL in a GET request. So it can be uh, like this here. So uh, as you can see, we have GET, and then you have an absolute URL, and domain name here, and some parameters. And there is no HTTP version, as I said. So you can still target those uh, applications that accept a request using GET, and there are just some parameters. 
Interestingly, Apache Tomcat supports headers with HTTP version 0.9. It's just against the standard, but they are doing it. They're, they, it's just fun. So now you can, whenever you're testing something on Apache Tomcat, you can just send HTTP version 0.9, and that's it. It's going to work. They don't care about it. And OK. And I saw this talk in uh, DEF CON 24, uh, hiding rookies in HTTP. Basically covers some interesting issues using HTTP version 0.9. I really recommend you to actually go and look at that. And uh, the, the, sh like the short recommendation here is, before I start anything with HTTP version 0.9, just disable it. It's safer. It's not being used by anything. Just disable it. Just make sure it can't go to your web server. So how can you send HTTP version 0.9? I tried Fiddler. I tried Zap. I tried WebSuite. I tried all these like web proxies. None of them could send HTTP version 0.9. Actually, Burp Suite could, but it was not showing the response, so I had to use Wireshark. But you can always use uh, Telnet, Netcat, OpenSSL, so on and so forth. But who wants to use these tools when, when testing a web application? You really don't want to use those low-level tools. So I'm going to show you a method to send HTTP version 0.9 in Burp Suite using HTTP pipelining. So let's start using HTTP pipelining. So what is HTTP pipelining? This is very quick introduction, uh, and I've stolen uh, that image as well from somewhere. So in HTTP, you can basically send your uh, request, and then there is a response. Send your request, there is a response. However, they introduced pipelining feature to HTTP version 1.1 and 1.0. So now you can basically send multiple HTTP requests as part of one HTTP request, and the server will respond to them at the same time. However, when I say at the same time, it will process the first one, then the next one, then the one after, and then we'll, uh, we'll send all the responses in one uh, uh, request, and, uh, one, in one response, and you will see everything at the same time. The only bad thing about HTTP pipelining for, te for testing and for bypassing WAF is that it's hop by hop. It means if it goes through the proxy, it's up to the proxy to decide what to do with it. Some proxies basically uh, will say, OK, I'm going to send multiple requests. I'm not going to continue uh, sending HTTP pipelining. Some proxies just let it go. And uh, some other proxies just send the first request. It all depends on how the actual proxy works. But on the standard, they should really send all the requests, how it's up to them. So here is an example of HTTP pipelining. So as you can see here, this is the first request. Imagine this is in Burp Suite, for example. And this is the first request. That's a GET request. And then I have the POST request immediately after. Because the first request is HTTP 1.0, uh, it's just I chose to use that in here just as an example. I had to include connection keep alive. Otherwise, it would think that the connection is closed because that's default on 1.0, and it wouldn't do HTTP pipelining. For 1.1, I don't need to mention this because by default, it's on keep alive, so it will go through fine. And you can send multiple messages. You don't need to send two, but I could only fit two in this slide. So. And I can even send them the other way around. So I can send the post request first and then the get request. However, if I'm doing that, you have to make sure the content length is actually showing the characters that are in the post body of your request. Otherwise, the server won't see it. As you can see, I've just misplaced them. So the server this time is going to see the post and then the get request. You could have had three post requests, one get request, anything. But this is just an example. So how can you do that using Burp Suite? So in Burp Suite, if you want to do that, first of all, make sure that the content length update is disabled. Otherwise, it will update the content length and it will ruin it for you. Also, what I found was uh, if there is accept encoding, sometimes you can't see the response in the, the response panel because uh, Burp Suite doesn't show the responses when it's compressed and it's pipelined. In here, I'm sending two requests at the same time with one HTTP request. And as you can see, I've received the first response here and the next response followed by HTTP slash 1.5, 200 status code and the response for the second request. So you can use this 
to basically send HTTP pipelining uh, to a web server. So what has this to do, like, to do with the HTTP version 0 0.9? Because now, HTTP, if you send just this get without any kind of like header, oh, yeah, you can't see the response. Also, if you send, use other tools, they will say it's invalid and they will not send it over. But if you send it through pipelining, you will see the response and that's cool because now I can use my favorite tool to basically perform my tests. So this really happened in one of the tests I had. So it wasn't admin, but it was something else. So imagine there, there is a website uh, that has a WAF in front of it, and that WAF has blocked the word admin. Whenever it sees admin in the URL anywhere, it blocks the request, and it cares about, it doesn't care about the character uh, cases, so it's case insensitive, so you couldn't bypass it by uppercasing admin or anything like that. Also, it had a feature that was supporting URL encoding, so it could understand if I was encoding it. So I had no way to bypass it. Also, directed traversal in here can't work because it can still see admin in the request. So what I did, basically, I targeted a page that was a normal page, index.jsp in this example, and uh, the content length here is 10. So as you can see, I have 10 characters before the get request to the, the, to the target page. And so I sent that request, and it went through the WAF. The WAF didn't know about HTTP version 0 0.9, and because of that, it didn't even see this as the second request, just let it go to the web server. And in the response, I had the response of index.jsp as well as this reset.jsp page on the admin side. Now imagine if that reset page was resetting something on the server. And because this is JSP and Apache Tomcat, I could have included headers. And this is, the, this is an example here to confuse the WAFs even further. So, Apache Tomcat also supports uh, carriage return rather than uh, the whole carriage return line feed. So basically, after you have your first request, you can start your, the second request. In HTTP version 0 0.9, you don't need to mention the version. So header starts from here because I have a carriage return here. And then uh, I'm sending a post request because why not Apache Tomcat supports it. So that can go through and that can really hit the uh, that like at user.jsp page. So if you have an Apache Tomcat, maps are even uh, more confused, can be more confused. In the example that I had, so the solution we found was like there was a tick box somewhere hidden inside the WAF and it was saying disable HTTP version 0 0.9 or something like that. As soon as we did that, it worked fine, but by default it wasn't ticked. So HTTP version 0 0.9 by default was supported. I think it should be the other way, way around. I have also created a Python, uh, like a module or just function that you can use if you want to, if you want to basically send your request, uh, not using Burp Suite, just using Python because you need HTTP pipelining or something like that. It basically fixed the pipelining for you. It, it fixed the headers. The, it cares about content lengths and everything. So it's very functional. You can use it if you want to. Okay, that was about the delivery. And now I'm going to talk about request mutation. That's the actual part that I like more because I can do more with this. So what is request mutation uh, and what is this category? So basically web servers may act differently depends on how they receive the requests. Something that is valid for one web, web server may not be valid for another web server because they have implemented things differently. And when this happens, when there are uh, kind of like uh, different features or different things being supported by the web servers, you probably can find bypasses because WAFs can also implement them differently. So we know about like HTTP, you may know about HTTP parameter pollutions, like if you duplicate some parameters, if WAFs don't know about it, they mo you may be able to find a bypass, uh, directory traversal and things like that might lead to a bypass as well. Today I'm going to talk about misshaped requests, but before doing that, I'm going to talk about RFC. So you can basically, it's like, I have seen other talks also in AppSecEU. They were saying, 
read the RFC, find the vulnerabilities. That's true. So if you really want to find some good vulnerabilities, read the RFC, find the vague statements like recommended, suggested, may, may not. So any web server or web application firewalls or proxies in the middle may have implemented these things differently. And because of these differences, a request that can be, uh, that is understandable by the web server cannot even be parsed by the WAF. So that is where it becomes interesting. However, that said, if you're just looking at normal features in RFC, WAFs probably know about them because they're, they're known. They, the people have talked about them in the past. WAFs, like, the WAFs are not as stupid. They will go and read RFCs as well themselves. And if some, there is something like this, they understand it. So what, what this one is, is just an example. In RFC it says, uh, Basically, it has been obsoleted in the latest version, but it is still being supported. You can, in the request that you're sending, you can have the header value in multi-lines, as long as the next line start with a space or tab, long tab character, then it will be part of the, uh, the header. As you can see it here, for example, host header, and then I have some space characters, tab characters, and then I have a, web, a domain name that, that had been filtered. So basically, I haven't bypassed any WAFs using this technique, using like line folding in headers, but in the past, I've bypassed some uh, websites that were filtered by the company I was working for using this because I really needed to access that Facebook page. So that's it. Uh, now I'm going to talk about custom implementation. That these are the things that are basically very interesting. These are the things that are not in the RFC, but then developers of the web servers or proxy decided to basically support these, or the web, app, web technology support, uh, decided to support these kind of things because they are cool, because why not? So the only way of finding these things are to fuzz it, to basically go there and see what would happen if I add this character, if I do this or do that. And I really like the semicolon character. It does different things in different web servers and. Uh, web applications. To just give you some examples, uh, you know like in the, in the URL or in the body of a request, ampersand is a delimiter between parameters. However, in Python Django, you can replace the ampersand with semicolon and send it over and it will understand it as a delimiter. So if there is a WAF that cares about the parameters and uh, it says it, it has a rule that, for example, when you see is admin equal to one or something, just block the request. Uh, if you add a parameter like this and add semicolon after that and uh, so on, you can basically bypass it. The other thing is like ASP Classic on OAS is always crazy about the stuff. Uh, like just to give you an example, if you have a person character not being followed by a hex value, uh, it can't be seen from an ASP Classic uh, <coughs> application. So percent %s is equal to s. That's quite good. Also, it converts, it converts the characters in UTF, like for example, UTF-8. So when you have like hyphen a or something like that, it will convert it to a. And in here, like we have i here, letter i. This is in UTF-8, it's probably I, some sort of I with dots on top of it or something like that. It will be converted to I and it will be a script again. So you can bypass WAFs using that. Even uh, some of the uh, uh, like uh, anti-cross-site scripting features on the browsers can be bypassed using these features. Also Apache Tomcat uses semi <coughs> semicolon in the URL path differently as well. So anything in the path when you're sending something to Apache Tomcat is a comment. So unless it sees a slash. So basically this path here is equal to this, uh, the red one in front of it. So path one semicolon foo is equal to slash path one. So you can still go there and uh, see a page if it cares about different things in the URL. However, I'm going to talk about something completely different today. And that's content encoding. That is what I like. And I think it hadn't been covered before uh, we published some blog posts uh, in NCC group website. So basically, if you read the RFC, it says, yes, we can have content encoding in responses. Actually, it doesn't say responses. It says HTTP messages. 
And because of that, you can use content encoding in the requests as well as the response, response uh, request. So what would happen is if you use carset in a request, you will encode all the characters that are inside the request and you will send it to the server. From server point of view, it's completely fine and it's normal, but it will bypass all the WAFs in the middle. So request encoding is all, can also be challenging because any web server can implement it differently. There, I couldn't basically, uh, so when I tried, ASP Classic on IIS did not support it. Also Apache IIS when I had PHP did not support it, so that's it. But for IIS, ASPX, Apache Tomcat, and uh, for Python 2 and 3 on Django when I tried, it worked. However, if you look at this table, you will see the differences. Uh, any single one of them is different than the others. So if you really want to use this technique during testing to bypass WAFs, uh, you will have a hard time to create a tool and you need to customize your tool every time. And uh, so this is how you basically need to encode your parameters. You, this, this simple Python code here can be used to basically encode the payload using IBM 037 and then it will give you this. I have URL encoded it in here. And that's it. It's very easy. However, you can't use this easily during a test. We need something to basically automate the whole thing. And I have created a Burp Suite plugin uh, extension called HTTP Smuggler. And you can download it from GitHub. It's accessible. It's still not in BAPA store because uh, th this is an early version of it. And, uh, but there is a jar file, you can just uh, download it and add it to your burp suite. And you can select the policy you want and if, for example, you're testing a new web server that is not there, then you need to use the custom one and just go there and see which one will work on the web server. Just give you some examples, like this is Cloudflare and I'm sending a SQL injection payload. If I will find the pointer, yeah, here. So this is a, a normal SQL injection payload that I'm sending. If I send it normally, I will get 403, which is like I've been blocked. If I use HTTP smuggler, and uh, because this was JSP, I was using uh, Apache Tomcat the policy, and I'm sending this using HTTP smuggler, then it can go through uh, Cloudflare without being blocked. The same with other WAFs. I have even tried it on mod security, but as you can see, I've cheated a little bit. I've added ampersand here. I've also capitalized our letter here was needed. And now if you send it without HTTP smuggler, you will be blocked. But if you send it through HTTP smuggler, then it will be bypassed and uh, there is no uh, in, like alerts from or warnings from uh, mod security. So this method can be quite useful. However, HTTP encoding is not always useful for testing if you have UTF-8 characters in your request. It may replace some of the characters with some question marks or something. So if uh, the request that you're sending to a server is changing something on the server side, you have to be careful about using that. Using HTTP smuggler, there is a tick box that is uh, disabled by default. And so it's safe to use HTTP smuggler. As soon as it sends that it is changing a character to something it doesn't have any idea about, it will not work. It will just return the actual HTTP request and it will not <laughs> encode it. And I found very interesting, uh, like, I can't side effect, I should say, because this wasn't a WAF bypass. This was just a side effect that, again, we published in NCC Group blog, and Microsoft basically said it, uh, it is very minor and it doesn't really pass the security bar, but it's very good and very interesting. So if you use request, uh, val so request validation in .NET basically blocks any HTML codes that are being sent to a, a .NET page and it will show you an error. So it's an anti-XSS XSS protection. So that's it. <coughs> However, I found out if you have on error resume next in VB.NET or for example, an empty catch like we have here in C Sharp <coughs> and it is reading some query string or form parameters. The first time that it reads query string or form parameters, it is uh, basically going to say, okay, this is an empty value. The second time it reads the same parameters or another parameter, 
it actually sees the value. So this is useful to basically exploit some stored XSS. And uh, it, it is also useful to bypass some validations because it has time of check, time of use vulnerability. Because when it reads it for the first time, it's empty. And when it wants to read it again, it's not empty. So that's when you can basically bypass some, some protections. But it's rare to see it, but whenever you see it, it's vulnerable. And the twist here is if your payload is in the URL, you have to send a post request. And if the payload is in the body, you have to send a get request. As long as you keep the content type from IIS point of view, it's still a post request. So it doesn't matter, but it will bypass the request validation. So that's the small twist there. Here is an example. So uh, in this ASPX page, uh, uh, we had that on error resume next, and it was basically showing the post param one once, uh, twice, and post param two uh, only once. Let me see if I can show the pointer. So as you can see here, the post param one and post param two was being sent to the server, encoded, as you can see here. And they have been encoded using IBM 500. And because they are in the body of this request, I'm sending a get verb. So that was needed, uh, but I'm, because I'm still keeping the content type as is, the server will see it as a post request. So if there, there wasn't any request validation, if it was disabled, I, I would have seen three alerts here. Two, like because I was printing this parameter twice and this parameter once, I would have seen a lot more, but there is an empty string and then this. And here is an example for a SQL injection challenge I basically put on my Twitter. Unfortunately, nobody sold this on time. Some people sold it afterwards, after the deadline, but was quite past the deadline and uh, I had, uh, they had help. So for that reason, I'm not announcing them as the winner. But this, this, is, the, this is the code. So on error resume next, and then I am reading the UID here saying if it contains single code, then it's unsafe and deny it. If it doesn't, then read it again and create a SQL query. Obviously, this is unsafe. And then I was doing something afterwards. In this example, I'm just showing it out, showing, like showing it on the page. So if you send the request like this, UID, some HTML, HTML tag here to trigger request validation, and then your SQL injection afterwards, uh, then you can exploit this. As you can see, because the parameter was in the URL, I had to send the post message here. And uh, this is IBM 500 encoded again, and it goes to the server and exploit the, the application. As you can see, it will see it as like being injected, which was very good. So if, how can you stop this? Request encoding is bad. How can you stop it? The way I found to stop this using mod security was using this rule. So basically this rule says whenever you see car set in a request or the, uh, the car set is not UTF-8, if it is in the request, then just deny the, the request. This is also a rule for Encapsula, just an example to say like this, uh, we can basically implement this similarly on other WAPs. So it will say again the same thing, character set shouldn't be there, and if it is there, then it shouldn't be UTF-8. It should be only UTF-8 and nothing else. Maybe I've, I've written that wrong, but not sure. <laughs> okay, so now I have a test case walkthrough to just uh, talk about uh, things very fast. Um, so in here, I'm just going to show you how to bypass some uh, web application firewalls uh, when, I, when I have IAS 10 and an ASPX page. This is very fast. I'm going through some simple steps and we'll show you how you can bypass them just by using some simple steps. So I have an ASPX page that accepts a post request and it's vulnerable. So for, in the first step, I'm just replacing post with get. So this is my request. I'm just replacing this post with get. As you can see, I have a SQL injection payload here that is going to be blocked by all the WAFs, like 
in this example. I haven't covered any other just because these were easier to be tested and I it quickly tested them during uh, the slides just like a few days ago. So as you can see, I've replaced post with get. Nothing happened, they still know about it, haven't been bypassed and everything is good. So in the second step, I'm going to change the content type from URL encoded to multi-part. It's standard, everything should work fine, and all the web servers should support it, except Apache Tomcat, and uh, it should be fine so for this example that I have, IES and ASPX. So this is the content type, URL encoded. I have just changed this using multi-part form data and a boundary. So you can just, in Burp, so you can just right click, change the content type, it's very easy to do that. Still, because this is quite a standard, it's being blocked by all of them. Now, from this point, it becomes interesting. Now I'm going to remove unnecessary parts that web servers don't need, basically, to understand a post request on IES, I should say. IES doesn't need these. Some other web servers have other behaviors. So in here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove these highlighted in red characters. So two hyphen characters here, 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 and also uh, after the, the last uh, boundary. It's not a standard, but I'm doing it because IES doesn't care. And then I'm also removing this form data. Just by doing that, Cloudflare and Akamai have been bypassed immediately. Yes, Encapsula haven't been bypassed, so they, they had some protections in place to, to know about this, but this can't be parsed by those two. So they have been bypassed. It was very easy bypass. So now I'm going to add some unused part or unnecessary parts to the same request to see what would happen if I confuse the WAFs even further, to see if I can bypass them completely. In here, this was the previous request that I had. I've already bypassed two of the WAFs, fair enough, but I'm now going to add more uh, useless parts to it. As you can see, I've, I have added uh, an additional boundary that is not needed, IS ignores that. I've also added these green parts here as well as this file name here. The space after the file name was actually important because if you don't do that, ASPX sees this as a file upload, so it's not going to be a request form, uh, a valid re uh, post request. So for that reason, IAS still sees this as a valid post request and it ignores the file name. However, at this point, all the WAFs that I was testing have been bypassed, which was quite cool. But you may say two of those WAFs have already been bypassed. So for that reason, I'm going to jump from a step two to a step four. So after I change the URL uh, encoded to multi-part, I'm not going to just add unnecessary parts without removing any, uh, any actually any parts that was not used. So I'm just adding stuff to the, the same request that I had previously. Just by doing that, Encapsula and Akamai have been bypassed. This time, Cloudflare actually wasn't bypassed and saw that as, it, it saw that as, a, as, an, as a dangerous uh, input, so it's still there. And now, just basically, okay, I, ha I only have five minutes, I know, so I'm gonna finish this early. So if I just uh, encode the same thing, like if I apply request encoding on the request that I had, it has already by bypassed all the WAFs, I know, request encoding on its own can bypass all the WAFs as well. But if I do that, just that, this was the first request that I had, and this request is actually equal to the request that I had initially, and it will go through all the WAFs and bypass everything, and nothing can understand it except IAS and ASPX page that I had there. And it's a valid SQL injection, and it's, it's fine. It, it does work. So lesson learned here, just quickly go through them. So uh, if you're using WAFs in the cloud, just uh, uh, do something. So using IP address directly can't bypass it. Also don't support HTTP version 0.9 at all. Uh, do not accept, uh, it only accept known uh, character sets. Um, also discard malformed HTTP requests. Don't accept invalid ones. And also if you can afford using a whitelist uh, WAF, then use that, it's, it's the best. And remember to whitelist Pentest's IP address 
during an assessment and remove, remove that afterwards. Because if you don't do that, you don't get the value for money. That's it. With that, thank you very much. Okay. Do we have any questions before we break for coffee? Thanks for a great talk, Suresh. Uh, obviously, the fact that some of the um, uh, cloud WAF providers, like Cloudflare and Capsular, behave differently for different tests, have you relayed the results of your research to them? And do they actually have a way of uh, fixing their rule set to make sure so they catch those exploits in the future? So basically, I sent the result to Cloudflare and Encapsula in the first place. And what I got was like, this is very standard to bypass blacklist WAFs. And it is quite normal. Every now and then, we will be bypassed. So then I was like, are you going to patch this? And they said, yes, we are going to do something about it. I reported this basically last year, around the same time as now. And uh, our blog post was published uh, in September. So basically, it's completely public. They know about it. They haven't done anything for it. So, Any more questions? Ah. Hello. Thanks for the great presentation. Uh, the Sorry. question is, under which conditions all this test was run? Because there's a different configuration, different rule sets. Yep. So I don't know under which. So, so the walkthrough was IAS ASPX. Okay. But when I was doing my research, I, was, I, I had those web servers that in that table that you saw earlier uh, on the request encoding. I was testing against those. I have created a, a GitHub project called HTTP.Ninja. If, actually, if you go to HTTP.Ninja website, you will be redirected to that. Um, I've fuzzed a lot of web servers and things like that, but it is still uh, in progress. So if you go there, you will see a table of all different behaviors, a lot more than you saw here, that how they basically act differently. And depends on what you have, you need to basically decide what you want to do. No, no, no the, the question is about the configuration of the WAF if, if, uh, itself. I mean, oh, okay. And there is all the rules and they're enabled. So they, the they were all features. defaults. So I did okay. not add anything to them and I did not remove anything from them. So. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's all right. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very thanks much. Thanks, everyone. Round of applause. Yes, thank you.